Hi there, come on in. I hope you had a happy and safe Christmas. We have a great show lined up for you, something you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're gonna take you, first of all, steelhead fishing with Captain Emil Dean, the patriarch of charter captains on the Manistee River. Have a great day of steelhead fishing. We're gonna take a look at grouse in the winter, ruffed grouse, the game bird of the north. Then we're gonna take a look at a previous elk hunt we've had in Michigan, the controlled regulated elk hunt, a recipe of smoked turkey roulades, which is outstanding and a lot more, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost, it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Small boats, they line the steelhead rivers in the fall, and in the spring, Bob Garner, Jeff Pierce, and John Olson are fishing with Patriarch Charter Captain Emil Dean aboard his jet-powered riverboat. Back in the 70s, when Emil started river fishing to extend his charter boat season, he and Joe Kimmerly designed this style of riverboat. It's made from aluminum with a water jet engine. Now, jet engines aren't really popular on fishing boats. They're not that easy to control, and they gobble the gas. But Emil found that on a river, especially a good steelhead river that's full of snags and rocks, a jet boat is a lifesaver because it doesn't have a propeller that juts down into the water. So it can skim over logs and sandbars. All it needs is a few inches of water and it makes it with no damages. That's what makes Emil's design so good on the river. The Manistee River is where Emil Dean spends his winters, taking customers out nearly every day. From the fall right through to the spring when the salmon start hitting in the Great Lakes, Emil catches steelhead trout from this river. Now you don't find the trout just anywhere. Emil has learned over the years where they're concentrated. He knows where the deep holes lie that hold the trout and those undercut banks. These are the areas he goes right to and fishes. He likes to get up early so he can fish from daylight well, until the time that the consumer's power plant releases water over the turbines at Tippy Dam, just upstream. That rush of water late in the morning raises the height of the Manistee by several feet, and naturally that changes the fishing significantly. The water hasn't risen yet, and Emil drops the anchor 20 yards upstream from a deep hole he says always holds fish. And here's one of Emil's favorite lures. That's a Hottentot with a big lip that causes the lure to dive deep and zigzag back and forth in the current. Emil's famed technique is called the drop back method. Now you don't cast to the steel head and you don't troll. You anchor above the holes and use Dacron line that doesn't stretch and drop the lure back in the current a foot at a time. Hold it for 10 or 15 seconds, then drop it back another foot or two. When you're through the hole, you reel the lure back in and start over. Instead of scaring the fish, this small boat seemed to trigger a strike. Oh, the little one! With a steelhead on, the other anglers pull in their lines so the fish wouldn't get tangled. Just when it looks like a steelhead is coming to the net easily, well, you find that it has other ideas. That's why Emil has everyone pull their lines in when one is on. In the river, the fish dodge back and forth in the current like a, a kite in the wind, and you frequently see its flash. As it gets closer to the net, it breaks the surface, and you can see how big and powerful a steelhead can be. Oh, I hate it when they do that. Pull them right towards me if you can, though. All right, all right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Hamel netted the fish and saved his hat all in one swoop. Well, this was an important steelhead for Jeff Pierce. He had been steelheading several times over the years, fishing from shore, and he had never caught one. A little disappointing. Steelheading is a lot like deer hunting. You have to be at the right place at the right time. You can't count on steelhead the way you can count on bluegills or catfish or perch. 
But Emeldine knows the holes, and he knows how to catch them. And he knows how to make his customers comfortable. On the kerosene heater in the cabin, a pot of fresh steelhead chowder had been simmering. Now, this was a recipe we featured on TV several years ago. It was in our 1986 Fish and Wild Game Classics cookbook. And we call it Emil's Fish Chowder. It contains evaporated milk. And, oh, is it tasty. You know, this is the way to get more enjoyment out of a hunting or fishing trip. Take some good warm food along, especially if it's a fish or game recipe you cooked yourself at home. Now, there's lots of things that you can make ahead, heat up on a boat or in the woods or on the tailgate of a truck. And there's nothing against taking a midday break and driving to a local restaurant. I mean, that, that can be fun when you're up north. But as long as you can stay warm outdoors, consider making a project out of your lunch. I'll tell you, food never tastes better than when you're outdoors. You can leave the rods in the holders with the line out. Every now and then you catch a fish during lunch. Well, it didn't happen today, but there weren't any complaints. With one nice steelhead already in the cooler and a hot bowl of Amel steelhead chowder in hand, there was no need to burrow into the heated cabin to keep warm. After lunch, it's back down the river to try some of the holes they passed up on their way upstream in the morning. Now the steelhead trout we're after look a lot like salmon, but they're actually a large version of the rainbow trout that's found in many small streams throughout North America. The steelhead strain migrates to open water, the Great Lakes, or to the ocean, where they eat like the salmon. They grow large, sometimes over 20 pounds. Then they go back to the rivers each year to spawn. This is when the anglers like to go after them because in the rivers, they really fight. Oftentimes, you'll see them leap completely out of the water. And every now and then, you'll get one that does it several times. That is a thrill. No matter how they battle, you can count on a knockdown drag out that'll keep you busy. The time to think steelhead fishing is between October and April, although the biggest runs come in the spring. All of the major rivers that feed into the Great Lakes attract steelhead, as well as steelhead fishermen. That's how it's done. You can fish the drop back method from a small boat with an outboard motor. You need just a good anchor, a few deep running lures, a pot of Amel's fish chowder, and the usual dose of fisherman's luck that's always a big part of successful steelheading. Occasionally from Emil Dean's river boat, he sees this kind of bird on the shore of the Manistee. This is a ruffed grouse, king of the northern game birds. It's sort of the counterpart, the northern counterpart to our Michigan pheasant. This is a grouse in a drumming posture. They're oftentimes heard, in fact, Emil was likely to hear them in the spring when he's steelhead fishing from the river boat. Ruffed grouse is an interesting bird. It's one that doesn't have, uh, nowadays, any management by the DNR. These birds pretty much manage themselves, have their ups and downs, and somehow make it through the winter. That's the subject of our story right now. Michigan's native game bird is not the pheasant, nor is it the wild turkey. The truly native king of the woodlands is the ruffed grouse. It's been in our north woods since colonial times, back before colonial times and there's been very little progress in the domestic propagation of ruffed grouse. In the late 1970s and early 80s, Michigan wildlife biologists tried trapping grouse because other states wanted to introduce ruffed grouse to their woodlands. So we made a few deals where we'd trade grouse for some wild turkeys, for example. Now, how did these little birds do in other states? Well, not too well, we hear. These little birds are delicate and temperamental and won't live just any place, and they aren't easy to trap. A length of fence called a lead is stretched along the ground, and since a grouse would rather walk than fly, it would walk along the lead and hopefully end up in the trap. That seemed to be the only practical way to trap them, but how successful was grouse trapping? Not very. Our deal was to trade one grouse for two turkeys, for example, but the Michigan DNR fell short because grouse were so hard to obtain. 
Not only do grouse resist trapping, but they're extremely difficult to breed in captivity. There are only one or two Michigan breeders who have been able to successfully hatch and raise them in cages. And the price on a pair of these penned raised grouse, we've heard, is about $1,000. So we have a bird here that we've tried to trap, tried to move, tried to propagate and domesticate, but it hasn't worked. This old DNR footage you're looking at is historical. The conclusion is that grouse and mother nature have kind of a thing going where they take care of themselves. Trapping and moving doesn't work because grouse like specific habitat where you find young aspen and popple stands. In other words, where you find the food and the cover they like, you'll find ruffed grouse. Move an eighth of a mile away where the habitat is not what they want, you won't find any grouse. When we hunted in Iron County with wildlife biologist Jim Hamill, he told us the cover, the little pieces of cover that would produce woodcock, and they did. He said, no grouse here, and there weren't. And he'd say, grouse here, but no woodcock, and he was right. A few places, he said, we'd find both. The moral of the story, find the cover, you find the grouse. Finding grouse before or after they're down can be a challenge even for a good grouse dog. Jim's pup searches high and low for this down bird and finally comes up with it. But what about this December season in the Lower Peninsula? Does Jim Hamill think it's really worth hunting after the snow falls? The December season in uh, Lower Michigan is a really effective time to, to take rough grouse, mostly because the birds are very concentrated in the heaviest cover that you have available. Oftentimes you don't have a lot of snow to cause the birds to be snow roosted for the entire 24 hour period. And also a big advantage of hunting the birds at that time of the year is, is you have some of that soft mast crop that's still up, especially gray dogwoods at that time of the year. So birds are super concentrated on whatever mast crop is still available, and they can be found on the very heaviest cover that you have, including cattails in reg northern region 3 and southern region 2. That's a very effective time to get very high flush rates and to be very effective on rough grouse. Excellent time to hunt the birds. But a curious thing happens after the snow gets five or six inches deep. The DNR says grouse hunters stay home by the fire, and the grouse change their habits too. Okay, if you have eight inches of snow or so on the ground, rough grouse will prefer to snow roost for most of the day. And what they do is burrow into the snow, and usually, usually enter the snow, burrow down near the ground, and then burrow off at an angle from their entry point for protection from predators. Once they are under that snow, Usually, it's about 20 degrees warmer there than it is right at the surface of the snow. So this is a mechanism not only to prevent them from, uh, or protect them from predation, but also to maintain their body heat. They will stay in that snow roost for almost a 24-hour period, at, and which coincides with sundown. Just at sundown, the birds will break from that snow roost, fly to the nearest, usually, aspen tree or tree on, in which they're budding, and they will pick buds off those trees at a very rapid pace. In fact, uh, for a 150-pound man to uh, consume as much food as a rough grouse does in 15 minutes, he'd have to consume about 27 pounds of food. So they, they eat buds very rapidly during that, during that evening period and then just fly directly down to snow roost again for nearly 24 hours. That's a typical day cycle of a rough grouse during the winter period. So they don't come out in the morning and eat then? No, very, very seldom or do they come out during the morning. It's usually a 24-hour cycle that's keyed into that snow roosting condition. So there you go. In the snow, hunt yeah. grouse in the evenings only. That's the key. The ruffed grouse, an interesting bird, a gallant bird, one that more and more hunters are going after. And they do have their ups and downs in the winter, the spring, predation particularly. Uh, is important to the ruffed grouse. Owls get after them in the woods. But the ruffed grouse is a bird that has always been in our northern forests and probably always will be an, an important bird to hunters in the state. There's another critter that really hasn't been in Michigan for too long. It's our elk herd. It's one that has been propagated and cultivated by the DNR to the point where in the 1960s they could have a limited elk hunt. We've had elk hunts all through the 80s. About 150 hunters per year partake in this. Let's take a look at the elk hunt from 1988, a year we were able to get up there and capture the elk hunting on film. 
Doesn't look like something you'd see in Michigan, does it? A bull elk. No, it's not on a hunting preserve or enclosed in a zoo. This is one of Michigan's wild bull elk of the Pigeon River country, a wild tract of land in the northeastern lower peninsula that's perfect elk habitat. So perfect that the elk herd has come up on boom times in the past 20 years. Their numbers approach 1,000 after the calves are dropped in the spring. And as far as the local landowners and farmers in the DNR are concerned, that's a few hundred elk too many. This spectacular footage was taken by DNR photographer Dave Kenyon, documenting the numbers and the size of Michigan's elk in 1988. This was taken just before the December hunt the DNR regulates so that elk numbers are trimmed back before winter. 72 elk were harvested in a special October hunt this year. This was on the western end of the Michigan elk range. That part of the herd migrates into protected areas by December and the DNR didn't want that part of the herd to get too far out of control. Now, when I'm talking about a wildlife population getting out of control, like elk or deer, I'm talking about constant increases in their numbers to the point that they actually destroy the habitat they live in. They destroy it for their own species. They destroy it for other species that normally live there. The Black River Ranch is managed by Jerry Gillette, who talked to Bob Garner about this Black River herd. Looking around at this clearing now, you say, when did you cut this clearing? This was cut about five, six years ago. Five and, or six years this ago? This was uh, supposed to be a grouse habitat or woodcock habitat cut. And it should be eight, nine, ten feet high by this time. And, well, let's see what you got. Well, you should have been able to shoot woodcock here this right, fall. Right, that was the object. We've been doing this, and every time we make a cut now, we got more open acres. Uh, we have about 150 elk in here in the fall. And you can see what they're doing, like a mowing machine. So we can't handle 150 elk in this place. Land managers like Jerry serve as guides during the annual elk hunts, taking the lucky hunters to the areas the elk are most likely to be found. On opening day, cameraman James Ford followed Jerry, who was taking Steve Leiter from Grass Lake onto the Black River Ranch, and it didn't take long to locate a couple of trophy bulls. If Steve wasn't so nervous and excited, he could have loaded his rifle in one-fourth the time. Steve was one of 145 successful applicants whose names were drawn by computer to receive December elk hunting permits. He's going for a bull elk that weighs five times as much as an average white-tailed deer, five times the venison in one shot. Let's be real quiet and tag along as he stalks within shooting range. There's two of them. This one right here, between them two trees here. This one right here? Right, that's the, that's the, the biggest. Left. There's one over here on the right one yeah, on the left? Yeah, the one on the left is the biggest one. He's got a beautiful right ride. Here, this First shot missed, so he squeezes slowly on his second. The big bull didn't flinch at the shot. It may not have felt anything, but it was a vital hit, and the effect of the bullet put the bull down quickly and humanely. If Steve was excited loading his rifle and trying to hold steady on the shot, can you imagine how he must feel right now? There's a certain anxiety most hunters feel about putting a big animal like this down, but when it's over, He'll have those big six by five antlers on the wall and at least 150 pounds of venison for the freezer. We were just we were just right over there interviewing a hunter, just just right over there, 200 yards, who had a nice cow. Looked across, there goes a bull by in the back of a pickup truck. But look at this bull! Look at this bull! This is this is a big six by six. Now, what's your name? Joel Stoic. Joel. What, uh, <laughs> this is opening morning and you've already got a trophy of a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I never thought it'd be this big. I was happy to get a smaller one, but, uh, man, when I shot this thing, went down, second shot, walked over there and just 
horns big. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. You didn't realize how big it uh, was when you when you were shoot or when you uh, saw it, right? No idea. I had no idea it was that big until I got about 50 yards from it. It was about 200 yards away, and uh, when I walked up on it, just all I could see was those horns. <laughs> those antlers fill up the back of a pickup truck. Not to mention the 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 rest of the elk. He's a big one. Big. <laughs> is, is this exciting? Oh, yeah, it was. I was excited. What happens when you get that permit in the mail? Not all of us have ever had that I feeling, huh? Couldn't talk. Just, I couldn't believe it. First when it came, I thought it was my doe permit. And I said, why would they send a doe permit registered letter? And then I opened it, and elk permit, I could see that. I just, I couldn't even talk. It was like winning a lottery. <laughs> For me, to be a hunter, to, to get one. You feel more like a millionaire right now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably rather have this than a lottery. <laughs> well, Joel Stoick's family might prefer a couple of million dollars instead of a six-by-six six bull elk, but like most dyed-in-the-wool hunters, it's difficult for us to put a price or a value on our right to hunt. Besides trimming the herd back to a more manageable size, the DNR's controlled elk hunt gives many families and friends a chance to enjoy meals made from excellent elk venison. That's a rare treat in itself. Hunters had a good track record on the December hunt. 143 out of 145 filled their tags legally and ethically. One hunter took a bull when he had a permit for a cow only. He was arrested. The other unsuccessful hunter gave up and went home after three days. The state record for weight was broken twice. The new record bull was a 6x6 that weighed 770 pounds field dressed. All this adds up to the fact that Michigan's elk are bigger and healthier than ever in 1988. What a very festive recipe called Smoked Turkey Roulade sent in by Lucy Banker. And this recipe is a little bit complicated, but it's really, really good. We've got mango chutney. Hot mango chutney. <laughs> Hot mango that chutney. That stuff is expensive. Yes, it is. And you only use a little bit, about a quarter cup in here, but is it good? <laughs> it's a good recipe to make and freeze. Um, and you're going to use a little bit of curry powder in with some cream cheese, and you just want to mix this all up together. You know, I made that the other night, and I put that in a little food processer. Oh, yeah. It mixes be like, <laughs> that stuff really Right great. now. It'd be done right now. And then you're going to spread the mixture on a tortilla shell. All the uh, way around it, of course. Well, just cross it. And then we get red lettuce and some alfalfa sprouts and some tomatoes. I'm just going to layer this in here, basically on one side, and, of course, the smoked turkey. And this is just a smoked turkey breast, and then oh, and cut that, off in pieces. That is real, Bo, Dave Bodecker. Yes, thanks, that Dave. <laughs> oh, I tell you, it's even better than the, the smoked turkey you get in the store. Oh, absolutely. This is a wild turkey. Uh, little and then, pieces of cucumber. Right, on and that's there a seedless too. cucumber. And mm -hmm. um, then alfalfa sprouts, and then you just roll it up jelly roll fashion, or like a tortilla. I made mine like a burrito, and I couldn't hardly <laughs> wrap it around. Yeah, you once. don't want to fill them too full because then you can't. And then you do want to chill this, and once it's chilled, then it'll then just slice, slice it. it. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll bet you Charlie Keenan is going to go ape over it. When I see something like this, it makes me nervous. This nervous. Pre this presents so well, it looks like nouveau cuisine. <laughs> And I don't think there's going to be enough of it to go around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it better taste good, and there better be extras. Mmm. <laughs> it does. Oh, it's incredible. Mm-hmm. Mmm. <laughs> and this, oh, that's a my word. That's an oh my word recipe. <laughs> oh my word. Oh, that's one when you bite into it and you go, oh my word. Mm. <laughs> that's fantastic. Funny what came to mind was, Yump and yiminy. <laughs> you uh, you got a, yes. a yump and yiminy mm -hmm. and an oh my word. I think it's along those lines. <laughs> but this is actual smoked wild turkey. Right. You know, it, it looks like it would be terribly healthy to eat. <laughs> but I bet you it probably isn't, does it? <laughs> well, yeah, it is. Probably like rich. Yeah, cream, mm -hmm. cream cheese has, has mm -hmm. less calories than butter, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're. you're and your this, turkey? This is, this is almost like eating dry toast. <laughs> Mm -hmm. As it relates to being healthy for you. Yeah, but what's it like to sit down and eat about 12 pieces of dried toast? <laughs> I mean, I could easily eat this whole plate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is really great. Yeah, I'm about finished, and I hope there's more. It's, des it's designed <laughs> to be an appetizer, too, isn't mm -hmm. it? Right. Hmm. That's a shame. <laughs> eat those big ones. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope you enjoyed this edition of Michigan Outdoors. This is sort of a holiday show where we programmed features that people have enjoyed, winter features, 
This is the time of year when things are really in kind of a hiatus. We're waiting for the ice to solidify so we can get out and do some ice fishing, uh, rabbit hunting in the woods. We have a lot of things in our files that we've taken over the summer that you haven't seen that we're going to look at during the course of this winter. So a lot of things are coming up. It's been a good year for you, I hope. Next year we're going to have a year-end review. So I hope you join us right here, and I hope you have a good holiday season. Be careful when you drive. See you next week.